All the fruit that's taking place in Mexico, because of uh, with just, just the ministry there from Brother Ron and even with his wife, his dear wife, who went home to be with the Lord and all that. Hey, that's credit to our account. Yes. That's credit to our account. And uh, we are investing in things that are eternal. So, so I want to encourage each and every one of us, let's keep being faithful and giving to missions. That's important. It cer- certainly is. Uh, thank you, Brother Ron, for the update. That's encouraging to hear. Well, if you have your Bibles, take them to Joel chapter number 2. Joel chapter number 2. Joel is one of the, the minor prophets. And so if you find Ezekiel, then turn your Bibles to Daniel, and then you'll find Hosea, and then uh, the book of Joel. Joel chapter number two. We're going, kind of been going through the minor prophets a little bit. I've, uh, as th- this past week, I'm just doing a little bit of reading ahead, going through the minor prophets. And then I asked my wife, I said, you know, sometimes I don't know what I got myself into as we're reading through the minor prophets. As I'm just reading these things, I'm just thinking, oh boy, what, uh, well, I think the Lord led us here, so... We're, we're going to go through it. We're going to go through it. So, all right. So if you're there and you're physically able, let's all stand out of honor and respect for reading of God's word. Joel chapter number two. And uh, looking forward to what God has for us here tonight. Joel chapter number two. Begin reading at verse number 15. Begin reading verse number 15 through verse 27. The Bible says, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. <laughs> Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. The priests, the the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach. That the heathen should rule over them, wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make your reproach among the heathen. But I will remove far off from you the northern army, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea, And his stink shall come up, and his ill savor shall come up, because he hath done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield her strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately. And he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years of, that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God, that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. Ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. Tonight's message is titled, Unashamed of the Lord Our God. Unashamed of the Lord Our God. Let's pray, and then you can be seated, and we'll get into the message. Father, we want to thank you, first of all, that you are a great and mighty, wonderful God. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to be here tonight. Lord, I'm thankful that you gave us a good day, Lord. And thank you, Lord, that as your church family assembles together, Lord, that we would hear from you. Lord, we can't afford to not hear from you tonight. Lord, I pray, dear God, that you would just be with the message. Lord, I pray that you would just uh, work in a great way. And Holy Spirit, just move amongst us, Lord. We need you so desperately. Father, we're thankful for the good report that we hear, Lord, from the mission field here tonight. And, Lord, I pray that you would just uh, continue just to work there and that uh, young men will continue to rise up, Lord, and and take the church and that pastors would be established there. And, and Father, that people would come to know you. Lord, I pray that you just be with us now, Lord. Be with me, Lord. Give me the words to say. Father, I need you so greatly. Lord, we love you. We praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Thank you. You may be seated. You know, in Joel chapter 1, uh, Joel chapter 1 covers uh, some judgment uh, that had 
that God had used to take place there. And in Joel chapter 1, just real brief rundown real quick. Uh, Joel chapter 1 talks about how God had used basically a plague to wipe out all of the, the children of Israel's fields. He used a plague, he used the insects, and he goes on to name them, the caterpillar, the pommel worm, the canker worm, and the locust. And he used all that to, to wipe away everything. And, and we come to find out that God had used that uh, type of judgment because he's trying to get the people's attention of an even greater judgment that was to come. Anybody remember that? And that greater judgment was known as the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord was coming. And, and then as we see in, in chapter 2, the first 14 verses talks about what the day of the Lord looks like. And then, and then the Bible describes the day of the Lord and God compared the day of the Lord, his judgment to this massive army that was basically indestructible. Could not be defeated. And, and, and it's like, hey, they could try to build walls, but it wouldn't matter. They could try to fight against them, but it wouldn't matter. And basically what God was saying is this, hey, my judgment, you can't stop it. You cannot stop my judgment. My, when my judgment comes, it will be destructive. It, 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 it leaves a path of destruction behind them. And that is the day of the Lord. But then we also talked about in, in chapter number two, the first 14 verses, that God called his people to do this, to rend their hearts. To rend their hearts. And, and that word rend has the idea of tearing away, but with kind of a, a, a deeper study of that, that word there, Ren gives the idea of a, a king being stripped of his garments. Royalty being stripped away. Well, well, what's that mean? Hey, when a king was stripped of his garments, he's saying this, you're no longer ruler. You're no longer king. You're no longer allowed to sit on the throne. And so God is saying, rend your hearts. So it's like God is saying this, hey, why don't you strip the authority away from yourself why don't you uh, strip yourself from sitting on the throne of your heart and let me sit on the throne of your heart? Amen. And when God sits on the throne of their hearts, they're, then, uh, hey, our God's gracious for sure. And because God says, when, when you rend your hearts, hey, I'm going to postpone my judgment. And rather than experiencing my judgment, you're going to experience my blessings. Yeah. yeah. So we get into... Uh, our passage tonight. And so tonight we're going to look a little bit more in depth as to God's calling for the people to repentance. And verses 15 through 17, uh, Joel, he calls the people to repentance. And Joel wants all the people to give attention to instruction for the repentance. And, and it goes on to say that they were to sanctify a fast. Well, well we talked a little bit about that last week. And it, and it gives the idea that, uh, of course, fasting gives the idea of not eating. But when to sanctify a fast, it means hey, that they're going to care more about getting right with God, even more so than eating. It's like they're saying, hey, our priority is to get right before God. And we're not going to eat until we do so. And then it goes on to say that they were to, uh, in verse number 16, the Bible says, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. And that, what is going on here is that there's a call for a solemn assembly. That means that, they, hey, they're to gather every single person together. Every single person is going to assemble themselves together for this special meeting. And from the eldest person all the way down to the infant child. And not one person is to miss out on this. I mean, this meeting was not to exclude any person. I mean, with everyone involved, I think it's, they're, they're all saying this, that we as a whole are in agreement that we need repentance. So everybody's there. Verse number 16 uh, says this, goes on to say, Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Well, what's that got to do with anything? Well, of course, uh, back then it was normal for a bride and a, and a groom to have their own little separate areas before their wedding ceremony. And, and, but on this day, on this day, when everyone's supposed to assemble together, hey, hey, the bridegroom, no, you're coming out. <laughs> uh, 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 the groom, yeah, you, you're coming out. The bride, you're coming out. A in other words, uh, repentance was the number one priority on this day. Good. It was... Uh, true repentance does not carry on as business as usual. So everyone is going to be involved in this. 
And then in verse 17, we see that God, he wants the leaders to demonstrate the repentance. Verse 17 says, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. I mean, God, he, he's speaking to the priest. It's kind of as though, I believe that the Lord, he expects the spiritual leaders to demonstrate repentance first. Kind of like, they, hey, the spiritual leaders should set the example of what it looks like for spiritual repentance. And rightfully so. I think spiritual leaders should be, uh, take the initiative and take the leadership there when it comes to spiritual repentance. Hey, hey, understand if, uh, I, I understand that I as a parent, I'm a spiritual leader of my home. Hey, you know what the next generation needs to see? They need to see this generation, well, humble himself from time to time and repent before God. They need to see that. Young people need to see their spiritual leaders, that they're not ashamed to hum them, humble themselves before God and seek repentance. Hey, they need to see moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas that are, that are not so proud to not go to an altar and bend the knee and seek God's repentance. Hey, the next generation needs to see that. Yeah, now notice the type of heart that God, he, he desires for them to have at the second part of verse 17. Now this is them uh, seeking repentance and and God says, let them say, spare thy people. No, God wants them to have this thought in mind. That God wants them to say, spare thy people. Now, that word spare implies this, that God's people, they understand that they deserve judgment. They understand that they are guilty before God. They understand that they are worthy of judgment, but still, uh, nonetheless, they, they are still pleading for God's mercies. He says, spare thy people. And then he says, spare thy people, Lord. I want to focus on th those two words real quick, thy people. You see, this is what God wants them to say. God wants them to say, spare thy people. God wants them to say, hey, we deserve the judgment. We know that we've done wrong. We know that we've sinned against you. But we're still begging for your mercy, so spare us. And he says, thy people. Hey, when they say thy people, you know what they're saying? God, we belong to you. We don't belong to us. We belong to you. And we acknowledge and we understand that we are your people and we are not our own people. What he says there. And then he says, Verse 17, again, the second part there, or the third part there, it says, And give not thine heritage to reproach, that the, sh that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? You know, what we see in this part of the verse is that real repentance is going to be concerned for God's glory. Yes. Real repentance is going to be concerned for God's glory. You know, uh, God, he wants his people to have this in their mind that say, and say, hey, spare us. We know that we're guilty. We know that we're guilty before God. We know that we are your people. But nonetheless, uh, uh, let's not let the heathen say, where is their God? God, we don't want the heathen to take any glory away from you. Hey, you know what real repentance is? Real repentance is saying this. God, I've offended against your glory. God, I am concerned about your glory. God, I am concerned about your name's sake. Hey, sometimes we say this. God, I want to get right because I want to protect my image. And we're concerned about our own image. And we're concerned about our own glory. But true repentance is this. Hey, we, we deserve judgment. And, and no doubt that we deserve it because we are your people and we're not our own people. But, but God, we are more concerned about your glory rather than our own. That's real repentance. So we see that God, he wanted his people to repent. And that church, listen to this. Now wake up here, wake up here. It says, true repentance accepts the guilt. And that true repentance is more concerned for God's glory more than our own. But once true repentance is taken place, once there is true repentance, then this is good news. God will restore his people. God will restore his people. Verse 18. Look there. Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. That word jealous is the same Hebrew word for zealous. 
zealous, to have zeal for. You know, when, when God's people truly repent, then God's going to be zealous for the land. Hey, that land that was destroyed by the plagues that we just talked about not that long ago, you know, that land that was destroyed by the insects, the land that was destroyed by famine, the land that had dwindled down to nothing. Hey, once there is true repentance, then God's going to be zealous once more to bless that land again. He's going to do that. And then the Bible says, and pity his people. Hey, after his people are truly repentant, he is going to have compassion on people. Hey, l- l- listen. Listen. After losing everything that they've owned, I mean, the context of Joel chapter 1 shows us they've lost everything. Their barns were broken. All the labor that they've had, all the labor that they put forth in, all their their vineyards, all their harvests, all their corn, all their wheat, it was all gone. But after true repentance, after losing it all, God is willing to have compassion on them uh, because they demonstrated true repentance, and he's going to bless them once again for that. Hey, church, our God is compassionate. We serve a very, very compassionate God. You know, we see here uh, that our God is full of mercy and compassion. Hey, hey, there are critics today that say, hey, the God of the Old Testament, he's not a compassionate God. There are. There are critics today that say, hey, the God of the Old Testament is a different, sounds a whole lot different than the God of the New Testament. Hey, the God of the Old Testament, he, he lacks mercy. The God of the Old Testament, he lacks uh, grace and compassion. The God of the Old Testament, he's full of judgments. Hey, can I just say the God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament? He has not changed. He is still very much the same God ever since the day of Adam and Eve all the way till this day in the year 2021. He's still very much the same God. And I love how what Joel does is that Joel, hey, though critics might say the God of the Old Testament, he's mean and he's, judge, he's full of judgment and he's full of wrath and, and he lacks mercy and lacks grace. Hey, Joel describes our God perfectly. He does. Hey, he is a God who will handle sin accordingly. That's our God. He will handle sin accordingly. He will judge sin because he's a perfect judge. Hey, our God is not a God who's just going to sit back and allow his people to live in sin and do whatever it is that they so choose. No, our God is a God who will judge sin accordingly. There will be a day of the Lord when he judges sin accordingly, for sure. But he is also, he will not, uh, he will not at all condone the actions of those who partake in sin. But this is the amazing thing, that he's still gracious enough He's still gracious enough to make a way of escape from judgment and experience his blessings. That's our God. And that's how Joel describes our God. You know, God God, uh, speaks about the restoring blessings of his people in verses 19 through 25. We're not going to go verse by verse there, but I'm just going to give us a a real quick uh, overview from those verses just for sake of time. Uh, It speaks about how once they repented that he's going to send them the corn and the wine and the oil. He speaks about how they're going to be a satisfied group of people. He speaks about how they're no longer going to look like a reproach against the heathen or amongst the heathen. You know what that word reproach means? It means disgrace. Disgraceful. Hey, even God's people, when they walk away from God, even they are even to look disgraceful even by the world's standards. Absolutely they are. Hey, they, 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 there are believers who turn their back on God and they get away from God. And even lost people can recognize and see just how, how beat up that the world is able to, uh, to have an effect on them. You know, God says that the world will no longer look at you or your land as shameful or disgraceful, but rather vibrant and promising. He speaks about how driving away the armies from the north. He speaks about how the Lord will bless their animals with, uh, with pastures. I mean, hey, our God's so gracious that he's even blessing their animals. He's even caring about their animals once there's repentance there. He tells the people to be glad because he's going to bless them with rain. Hey, that's something that we appreciate around here, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Verse 23 says, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain 
in the first month. You know what that means? It says, hey, that rain, the rain that God withheld during your rebellion before you repented, hey, the former rain, the rain and, and, and the rain to come, the, the, the latter rain, hey, all that rain, he's going to bless you in the first month. That's a lot of rain. <laughs> That's a lot of rain. And it's going to restore all the loss that those plague of insects destroyed. God is going to replenish everything that he allowed to be taken away. Hey, church, don't ever get the idea that the God of the Old Testament is not a gracious and merciful God. Because he is a gracious and merciful God. Because of his goodness, because of his mercies, God's people, listen to this, they will be unashamed that he is the Lord their God. Verse 26 says, And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God, that he hath dealt wondrously with you. Now here it is. And my people shall never be ashamed. Verse 27, and ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. See, we notice in these two verses that the Lord speaks about how well he has dealt with his people because of their repentance. And the Bible says that he dealt with them wondrously. That means that he dealt with them marvelously. He, he dealt with them wonderfully. He dealt with them extraordinarily. And then he reminds them that, that, uh, that he is in their midst. And that because he is in their midst, hey, there's no other God but him. And God's people who remember and God's people who remember how good he is ought to not be ashamed that he is the Lord their God. Hey, because they were able to experience his blessings, because they were able to experience his goodness and his mercies after they repented, hey, they're able to do this. They're able to go about their daily lives unashamed that he is the Lord their God. Yeah. But this is what they had to do. They first had to repent. They first had to repent. And because they repented, they're able to express that they were unashamed that he is the Lord their God. And I believe that God wants us to get something across here tonight. I believe this, church, that you can live a life that is unashamed that he is the Lord your God. You can live a life here and be completely unashamed that he is the Lord your God. Yeah. What does it mean to be ashamed of the Lord? Well, when, typically when we're ashamed of something, we really want to disassociate ourselves from whatever it is that we're ashamed of. That makes sense? If we're ashamed of something, then we don't want to associate with it at all. You know, uh, it's been a, quite a few months ago, but I remember I was watching a documentary about some people who were related. They're, they're, they were the great-grandsons or great-grandchildren of those who served in Nazi Germany. And their great-grandfathers were a part of the Nazi regime. They were a part of the SS. They were a part of Hitler's henchmen, if we can say it that way. And so they, they, they have these reporters, and, and they're going to them, and, and they're interviewing them and say, hey, hey, hey is this true? Are you a, an ancestor? Is your ancestor so-and-so who served alongside Hitler? And, and is this true that is your ancestor one of the, one of the doctors or scientists who performed all these experience, experiments on the Jewish people? And, and I'll tell you, when they, when they came out with the truth and saying, yes, it is true, they had nothing but shame about their great-grandfathers and their grandfathers. Right. Nothing but shame. And to the point where they said, hey, I, we want nothing to do with our great-grandfathers. We want nothing to do with that heritage. We don't condone their life. We want nothing to do with that lifestyle. I mean, to the point where they're changing their names and, and, and I, I could be wrong in this, but you know, once they, they probably were trying to uh, apply for jobs and, and, and once their employers found out who their relatives were, that they, they wouldn't hire them. And so they, they had to really, really just disassociate themselves from their family tree. You know, I can't really blame them. 
Can't really blame them for wanting to be ashamed of their grandfathers and great-grandfathers and after what they've done. No, they wanted to live their life contrary to that old life. Now, like I said, I, I really can't blame them for that. But I believe when God's people live contrary to the way that he wants them to live, in a way, we are disassociating ourselves from God. When we live our lives contrary to how he tells us to live our lives, church, in a way, what we are doing is we are disassociating ourselves that he is the Lord our God. Hey, God's people are living a life that communicates when, when we decide to live our lives the way we choose to live our lives, when we decide to live our lives according to our plan, our ways, uh, 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 our, our ambitions, our dreams, and our goals, rather than God's way for our lives, then what we are communicating is this, that we are ashamed that he is the Lord our God. Yeah. You know, our lives communicate that we're ashamed that he's the Lord our God when we blatantly go against his will for our lives. Right. When we blatantly say, you know what, God, I know what your word says. I know what the spirit of God is leading me to do. I, I, I know what the preacher says. But I'm still going to do what I want to do. I, I'm still devoted to living my life the way I choose to live my life. And we, when we constantly say no to the leading of God, when we constantly say no to the Spirit of God, and we constantly say no to the Word of God, then this is what we're doing. We are communicating this, that we are ashamed that He is the Lord our God because we are disassociating ourselves from His Word. You know, our lives communicate that we are ashamed that He's the Lord our God when our peers know nothing about their Christian testimony. Hey, when our peers, the people that we see on a regular basis, if they don't know that we're believers, if they don't know that we're Christians, then, then hey, something's wrong. Something's wrong there. And they should know. But, but if, they don't, if they don't know that, uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ is our Savior, and they don't know about our Christian testimony, then we are living a life of disassociating ourselves fr from the Lord our God. And basically we're saying this, that we are ashamed that He is the Lord our God. You know, our lives communicate that we are ashamed that he is the Lord our God when we have no desire to share the gospel with people. You know, if this is the case, if this is the case for us, if this is the case in, in, in your life or in my life, that, that, that there's something in our lives that, we're, that we say this, that we say, you know, I'm going to live my life. I know what God's word says. I know what the preacher says. I even know what the spirit of God is telling me to do. But I'm still going to do what I want to do. And I'm, going to, I'm, I'm just going to push away. I'm going to push a, 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 away the, the counsel. I'm going to push away the, the knocking of the Holy Spirit of God. I'm going to push those things away. If that is the case in our life, and we are living our lives like we are ashamed that he is the Lord our God, then we're going to need to do something kind of like what they did. And what do they do? Repent. We're going to have to repent. And we're going to have to demonstrate some true and some sincere repentance. What does true and sincere repentance look like? Well, it looks like this. Understanding, hey, we deserve judgment. We deserve judgment. Hey, we are guilty. We, we, we are the ones who've committed sin. Hey, it is because of our sinful choices that we choose not to be the witness that God wants us to be. It's because of our sinful choices that, that, that we, are, we have hurted our testimony in our workplace. It's because of our sinful choices that when the Spirit of God is knocking on our hearts over and over and over again, that, that we constantly push aside and we push away and say, no, 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 I'm going to do what I want to do still. Hey, we need to understand that we are guilty before a holy God. Right. We are guilty before him. Hey, there's a lot of Christians still playing the game. There's a lot of Christians still playing the game, and, and, and they'll go through all the outward motions, and they'll go through uh, all the outward actions, and, and they'll hold their Bible under their arm, and, and they'll dress sharp and do all those types of things. But God is still desiring that people would rend their hearts. Right. Still desiring that. 
hey, if we're playing the game, we, we, need to, uh, <laughs> we need to demonstrate some true and some sincere repentance before a holy God and acknowledge, God, I am guilty before you. I'm not going to push the blame on anybody else. I'm not going to push the blame on this influence or on that influence or on that influence or on that influence. No, 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 no. This is between my sin and you, and I am guilty before you, God. That's what true, true sincere repentance looks like. And when you do demonstrate some true sincere repentance, hey, our God is so merciful that he's willing to delay his judgment to replace his judgments with his blessings. Boy, hey, I don't, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm a little dense. I'm a little dense in the head. And this is where my wife should say amen. But she, she lost it. Hey, I'm dense. Hey, there's times where the Spirit of God is knocking on my heart over and 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 over. Hey, when God is constantly knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking and he's telling me, Richard, stop playing the game. Richard, stop playing the game. Richard, stop playing the game. You know what God is doing? God is postponing his judgment. <laughs> he is postponing it. He's saying, it's gonna come, Richard. It's gonna come, Richard. It's gonna come, Richard. But he is so good and he is so gracious that he's willing to postpone his judgment until finally when God has to get a hold of my heart and I get to humble myself before God, God says this, all right, I'm not going to give you my judgment. I'm going to give you my blessing. We serve a gracious, merciful God. Yeah. Hey, a believer who is truly repentant, a believer who experiences the goodness and mercies of God after repentance it doesn't really make sense for them to actually be ashamed of the Lord their God. Right. It makes absolutely no sense at all to be ashamed of the Lord their God. I mean, they could say this, this is where I was in my life. This is what I was doing in my life. And I deserved judgment. I deserve the wrath of God. I shouldn't be alive today because of my actions and because of my decisions and because of my sinful choices. I should be dead in a gutter somewhere. But, but, but by God's goodness and by God's grace, he convicted my heart and he knocked on my heart and he gave me ample time to repent. And then when I did repent, he gave me blessing after blessing after blessing more than I deserve. He blessed me far more than I could ever possibly deserve. So because he's done all those things, you know what I think I'm going to do? I think I'm going to live my life the way I want to. What sense does that make? It doesn't make a lick of sense. I'm going to live my life the way I want to. I know what his word says. And I even know what the spirit of God is saying. But I'm still going to live my life the way I want to. You know how we're living? We're living like we are ashamed that he is the Lord our God. Right. Hey, true repentance knows. True repentance acknowledges that what you deserve is the judgment of God Almighty. But because of his goodness and because of his grace and because of his mercies, he's willing to postpone that and give you his blessings rather than his judgments. So therefore, the only thing that makes sense is this. To live your life that doesn't bring shame to the Lord our God. To live a life that says this, hey, you know what? I'm going to live my life according to his word. I'm going to associate myself with the Lord my God because he's merciful and he's gracious. This is where I was. This is what I deserved. I des hey, hey, all of us deserved a devil's hell. Yes. Amen. All of us deserve the judgment of God. All of us deserve that. Absolutely we do. But what sense does it make after we've experienced his goodness and his mercies that we still decide, I'm going to live my life the way I want to live my life. It makes no sense at all whatsoever. Yeah. But yet we do it. But yet we do it. We think to ourselves, 
when the Spirit of God knocks on our heart about something, about the things that we watch, about the things that we say, about the jokes that we laugh at, about the things that we put in our bodies, about the things that we put on our bodies, our dress attire, our modesty, or the lack thereof, and, and, and when the Holy Spirit of God knocks on our hearts, this is what we often tend to do. It's not that bad. It's not that big a deal. This show isn't that bad. I mean, they only blaspheme God's name every once in a while. It's quiet. This show isn't that wrong. Isn't that wrong? The, the things that I post on Facebook, it, it, it's not gossip if it's true. You know what we do? When we live our lives apart from his word, it's like we're saying this, I'm ashamed that he's the Lord my God. After everything he's done, after how gracious and how merciful that he's been, hey, tonight you can walk out of here unashamed that he's the Lord your God. Unashamed. But it just might have to take this first. There might need to be some repentance involved. True, genuine, sincere repentance. What does that look like? God, I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I deserve your judgment. Spare thy people. Hey, I belong to you. I don't belong to me. Help me rend my heart. Help me strip the authority from myself and put you as king of my heart. There might need to be some repentance involved. Hey, hey, let's not let pride get in the way from us doing business with God. Because it, cause seriously, all of us can do some soul searching right now. And I'm pretty sure each and every one of us can find something that says this. My life doesn't match up with this. There's something in my life that doesn't match up with this. And, and, and here's the thing. If you ask God to show it to you, he will. He will show it to you. He will reveal it to you. And when he reveals it to you, be willing to bow the knee. Be willing to bow the knee. Be willing to get low before a holy God and say, God, I'm guilty. I deserve your judgment. Right. Hey, just because you're a child of God doesn't mean that God won't deal with the sin in your life. Just because you're a child of God doesn't, doesn't give you a free pass, doesn't give you a license to sin. No, God deals with his children. God deals with it. I said this last week. Our God is not a negligent father. Our God does not allow his children just to go do whatever they want. No, no. He, he's a good father. He's a good, and, and a good father will discipline his children. And don't just think that because we are saved, because we're born again, yeah, that God's not going to deal with the sin. No, he will. But he's just gracious enough in giving us ample time and ample opportunity to get right with him. The question is, are we willing to do that? Are we willing to get right with him? Are we willing to repent before a holy God and determine to say this, you know what, Lord? I want my life to reflect this word. I want my life to reflect this book. And when you live your life that reflects this book, this is the thing. You are living your life unashamed that he is the Lord your God. You, you know, I think if we're not careful, we might get the idea, hey, I'm not ashamed that he's the Lord my God. And then curse every other word. <laughs> I'm not ashamed that he's the Lord my God. I tell everybody that I go to Calvary Baptist Church. Bleepity bleep 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 bleep. Hey, if that's your language, don't tell people you come here. Don't tell people you come to Calvary Baptist Church if that's your language. Hey, don't tell people you come to Calvary Baptist Church if you laugh at dirty jokes. Don't tell people you come here, please. Help the testimony of this church by saying that you don't come here. <laughs> That sounds awful, isn't it? <laughs> but here's the thing. When we don't live our lives according to this book, basically we're saying this, that we are ashamed that he is the Lord our God. Get low before God so that we can live our 